uh, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this first of a, hopefully of a series of um, interview talks. Let me briefly first motivate why we are doing this, what's the idea behind this, why we invited uh, Dan to be our first person to interview, and then also thank the people who made this possible. The, the 20 of us are sitting here nicely together. There are like 20 or 30 or 40 people online. We are also recording this to, to be able to upload it later so we can all enjoy ourselves. But of course, there's always those people who have to make this work, right, who are doing the, the working and the technology now that you are sitting and hopefully listening to, to Dan's um, uh, hopefully interesting and insightful answers. So I would like to uh, thank um, Kitty and Karen and Ray and, and, and Shirley and uh, also the, the um, instructional development team for making this work, for recording, for looking at the chat, for making the technology work and so on. So why are we doing this? I think that what I've seen over the last many years, at least in the domains that, that I'm frequenting, whether it's information science or computer science and related fields, is that we look at the world in paper chunks. And we only invite people to give paper chunk talks. So what we learn about somebody's career is, a, is essentially a paper written by, you know, co-authored by 10 people. And maybe then if you interview somebody for a job, we hear maybe some of their other ideas and then maybe something about their teaching. But we, we rarely hear something about the what makes a person a researcher. What is their vision at large, right? And what defines them as a person and their contribution, not only to their own domain, but also to society. So I thought that this would be um, a good thing to do. And I know that many other domains are very good at doing this. We as information scientists or computer scientists, we don't have really this kind of tradition. So I, I, I happened to, to do an interview like this roughly half a year ago with uh, Gilberto Camara, also online doing the Spatial Data Science Symposium, and it went very well. Uh, Gilberto is such a char charismatic person, I only needed to, you know, to trigger him with some questions, and then he would go off and, and, and tell us all sorts of very interesting things about his life, his research, why he decided to do certain things, what he believes is the best way to make impact. And then I almost forgot about this and that this is such a nice setup until I had the, the great honor to interview John Lee, who's sitting there. And John is also an extremely charismatic person, so I found myself again in the role of just having to prepare some questions. Hopefully, you know, look into John's big eyes and let him go and talk, and, and everybody thought it's wonderful. So I thought, maybe I can pull this off a third time, but of course I need the same charismatic person who can just be, you know, triggered and then go off on their own. So I have prepared some questions for you, Dan. As you know, I hope I... I I would inspire an interesting conversation here. And um, if this goes like, I hope you will just imagine yourself being in an old rundown pub somewhere and, and listening to, to two people who hopefully have something interesting to say, and then you can jump in. And the more discourse, the more disagreement, the, the better. I have some questions as you know, where I hope we will disagree. Uh, and I also wanted to start with a personal story, how I met Dan. And I wanted to run it by then 10 minutes ago, but he isn't sure whether this is really how it played out. And this may have something to do with alcohol, but we are not getting into details because this is recorded. So I'm going to tell my story, and then you can disagree or we can dive right into, into well, our interview part. I believe that besides me coming here as a PhD student and us getting to know each other and I having read your literature before, that I ran into you in, at COSIT in, in France and that there was directly opposite to the conference location a really run down pub with only you know a specific kind of people sitting there and i was there late at night and there was only one other person late at night there very loudly discussing <coughs> with with the with the bartender and i believe that was you and i believe we had a good discussions and one of us had some good drinks as well okay so whether you agree or not okay sure I, I was what, what were we talking about? I don't remember anymore, but I do remember you then. So it had to be a fun discussion. I'm sure we disagreed as we did many times, which is one of the things I enjoy most about you. Then um, let's first I'm start a little bit with a question about, about your career, right? Where you came from, why you decided to, to become who you are. And I think you also have a little bit of an unlinear career, same as me. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to briefly comment. Right. on your academic trajectory. Okay, super. Well, thank, first of all, thanks for inviting me. This is a lot of fun. I don't, I don't know if I can live up to the charisma of the previous speakers, but I'll do my best. And uh, thank you all for showing up and <clears throat> everybody that's uh, 
not here in person. Uh, I'm enjoying imagining you. Uh, yeah, I uh, was into all different natural sciences when I was a kid growing up. <clears throat> you know, geology and astronomy and chemistry and different things. And I remember my mother, uh, bless her soul, bought these Time Life encyclopedias. And there was one volume on the mind, which I really enjoyed. Especially the chapter on optical illusions. And there was a chapter uh, I really enjoyed about uh, mental illness and, you know, Oh, there was a chapter on intelligence testing. All of this stuff, I, I really enjoyed that. And then later, I think it must have been between 10th and 11th grade, I went to an NSF summer program at the University of the South. And there I was introduced to psychology as an academic discipline, research psychology. And I really got turned on by that. Came home and I told my parents, you know, and they were lying in bed and I was telling them about it. And, oh, I really enjoyed psychology. My father immediately said, you mean psychiatry, which I didn't mean that, but that, of course, means that you have a medical degree. And in fact, my mother was a nurse, and so I went to undergraduate school at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and I was a sort of generic pre-med student, like so many are at that school, but I was interested in psychology, and eventually I became a psych psychology major. And like so many psychology majors, I imagined that I would go into clinical psychology. It's just sort of a default, super popular major in the United States. And I went to see a professor there, and he did the great good thing of convincing me I didn't know what the hell I was thinking about. It was really powerful, the, the, the power of good advice, even when it's negative, which he basically quizzed me on what kind of therapeutic approaches I liked and stuff. And I was sort of like, you know what? I don't actually care about helping people's mental problems. What the hell is it going on here? That's not. So I went to the library, looked in some literature, and I discovered this fairly new field called environmental psychology, which is sort of like uh, invented in the 60s, like so many other academic innovations. And it's sort of like a branch of psychology that says, let's get out of the laboratory and look at the real world and not control everything so much like experimental psychologists including social psychologists like to do. And we're going to look at actual places where people work and live and play. And we're going to think about the psychology as not just being a function of an individual, but an individual in a world. And that is absolutely something that appealed to me, and it still appeals to me. So I went off to Arizona State University to go into an environmental psychology program. There are very few of them. There were very few of them. Uh, I wanted to get away from the East Coast and go someplace where none of my family had ever been and just other kind of, I don't always make decisions in the most rational manner, but I'm a big fan for trusting your feelings. Well, same here. So then I, uh, <clears throat> I learned about spatial cognition from my advisor, Ed Sadala. That was something he was into. And then I went to the University of Minnesota as a postdoc, the Institute of Child Development, as a matter of fact, and I worked with Herb Pick in part because children are people too, and obviously understanding children is going to be a big part of understanding adults and stuff, you know, other interesting things like that. But Herb was also a leading uh, figure in spatial cognition. I struggled to get a job. <laughs> I really did, for a variety of reasons, some of which I'm to blame for, and some of which I'm probably not. But keep in mind one thing, you only need one child. And if you can hold out long enough, you might get that job. I actually got a visiting assistant professorship in psychology at North Dakota State University. And I was there for one year. And then I finally had some good success on the job market. And among other things, <clears throat> my advisor at Minnesota, Herb Pickett, sent me the ad for a job that UCSP Geography had. And it was because of Professor Reg College, who, more than anybody really, uh, helped to invent the field of behavioral geography, which is basically psychologically accurate models to inform geographic models of spatial behavior, so on, so the, that sort of thing. Can your mic slip down? You may want to put that there. I may. I don't know how close this needs to be to my... We'll try to see. How's that sounded back there? Okay. Thank you. Um, anyways, I applied and I got interviewed here at UC Santa Barbara and I got the job. 
And so I came out here, and basically, besides the fact that here's all of psychology and research psychology, and down in this corner is this strange peripheral thing called environmental psychology, and here's all of geography, and I don't know which circle, is, no, geography is even a bigger circle. And down here in this corner is a strange peripheral thing called behavioral geography, and all I had to do was jump over the fence. That's basically the way that worked. I really like that you mentioned your influences, and that would have been my follow-up question. So they always say we all stand on the shoulders of giants, which I think is very true. What are your key academic influences? Well, you know, first of all, I can, I can only imagine that I don't know all of them. <laughs> and I think when people get asked a question like this, a lot of the questions today, and in general, probably assuming people have conscious access to things they don't necessarily have conscious access to. Having said that, I really do have to start with my dear old mom because her curiosity was infectious for me in all, just about everything, and buying those encyclopedias. It wasn't only the Time Life series, she had them all over the house. And I happened to be the sibling, probably, who read them more than any of the rest of my siblings. Sorry, no offense, folks. <clears throat> so, you know, there were a couple of high school teachers that were influential, and a couple of college teachers, like David Olton was a famous rat psychologist that influenced me quite a lot. And of course, when I went to graduate school, all of my advisors there, Ed Sadala and Doug Kenrick and Clark Presson and Steve West, Peter Colleen, you know, they were, they were all pretty influential. Um, her pick, my postdoc advisor and Reg Gollage, of course, here. You know, if I'm going to be more general, though, to, to mention some uh, people I've never met personally, well, one of them I did meet personally, but um, I've been influenced a lot by the psychologist William James. Uh, I would say by Jean Piaget, I, I would say J.J. Uh, Gibson, um, Roger Shepard, I did meet him one time. Um, I was influenced, uh, you know, by Tolman, but the, and also by the, the famous planner uh, Kevin Lynch, uh, famous book, Image of the City, and I would say the cartographer Arthur Robinson. Um, I'm kind of a Kantian as well. So I'm, I asked <laughs> an AI about who were your key influences just to annoy you. And here's the ordered rank list. Reg Gollich, Mary Haggerty, Andrew Frank, David Mark, and Sarah Fabrican. Who said that? That's semantic scholar telling you that. Well, then that shows the deficiency of semantic scholar, doesn't it? <laughs> Those are some pretty good names there that you all know and, and, and certainly have. I would actually uh, definitely, <laughs> I would definitely agree with Andrew Frank. Yeah, I I should, I'm too. sorry, Andrew, I forgot to, to mention <laughs> that. Not that the others have had no influence. But. Absolutely. So you are known for so many things, I obviously can't ask about any of those, so I'm just going to pick those that I also share an interest with you in, namely for, for types of regions, very cognitive regions, other types of regions. So what is the current state of the art there, and where do you think is this going? Is the last word spoken on, so to speak, what types of regions are there and how to discover them? You know, re regions, it's a very fundamental geographic concept, and there's other kinds of regions, but geographic regions... You know, they're basically, they're close to two-dimensional, you know, maybe between two and two and a half D if you want to get technical. But they're essentially two-dimensional features or pieces of Earth's surface. And I don't really know why, but they just fascinate the hell out of me. I, I'm, I don't really have an explanation for that, but I just think that they're super fundamental. I happen to believe that they're universal in human thought and communication and reasoning. So they're obviously super important. Uh, to understanding human beings. Um, in terms of, you know, where is it going and so on, I think that some of the, what do you call it, um, data science, which is a silly term, all science is data, come on. But I, the term means something a little bit more than just data. It's data that somebody else created without your permission. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I do think some of those kinds of approaches like that you've done, and it was a nice paper we worked on together, there's definitely more there that in, in the realm of regions. I think the fact that uh, human beings, on the one hand, existing regions like countries, there's numerous demonstrations of how they influence the way people think, judgments about distance and latitude and, and different things like that. On the other hand, People regionalize. Again, it's my belief that this is culturally universal. Um, 
I know David Mark would say, have you tested every culture? No, David, I haven't gotten around to it yet. But anyways, I still I do believe that. That we'll regionalize even when there's no obvious physical basis for boundaries. You know? Um, and so that's very fascinating to me. And I think future research can look more at what are some of the bases that people do tend to use to establish boundary locations uh, when there is no obvious objective reason for putting a boundary there. Just so everybody's crystal clear here, we're well aware a boundary need not be precise, thin, exact, or anything like that. They're typically not. They're regions themselves. The boundary is vague, fuzzy, whatever term you want to use. Oh, you got very lucky there. I'm sure Werner was waiting online for you just saying this. So well, I just want to make sure that everyone realizes that, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of this and it's important that boundaries are not, in most cases, precise, um, you know, ways to differentiate in the region versus out of the region. They're transition zones. And I, I just I just would say that, uh, you know, there's still more interesting work to be done on what is the basis that people use. And also how non-spatial variables, attitudinal variables, and so on. Just to give you an example, um, there's a strong relationship between spatial regions and categories of people. Of course, regions are spatial categories, right? And so how things like ethnicity, political beliefs, and so on influence people's uh, laying of spatial boundaries on the Earth's surface. There's a lot of interesting questions there. Are you okay with me picking a fight with you? Yeah. <laughs> sure, why not? What do you mean? You didn't mention time. You don't ask permission to D? fight someone. What's that? 2.5D? What about time then? What about it? Well, regions have a very strong temporal component, right? There may be different regions during the day, the region that you feel safe, for instance, during the night. We may be just seeing changes in regions playing out right now, right? I mean, how, how, am I supposed to say no to that? <laughs> just trying to annoy Okay, you. but I'm just going to make this comment since I've decided to, that I would take today's rare opportunity to just to say whatever I felt like saying. That's why we have you. Un here. Unlike most days. Um, <laughs> people really exaggerate time. Oh, okay, see. It's trite. It's really, it's trite. Of course it's true, but it is... Equally true to imagine, Werner's upset right now. It's equally true to imagine the world in a moment in time. Okay? And there's nothing wrong about that. Yes, yeah, naturally. Okay? Idea. Yes, of course, our regions are not static entities in most cases. Yeah, that's true. And there's lots of interesting research questions about how things change over time, why they change over time, and stuff like that. But uh, fundamentally, um, the meaning. The ontology of regions is not particularly temporal in a uh, fundamental sense, even though I think you disagree. Oh, I, I totally do. But we can discuss this later. But now that we are talking about things where we disagree, I like this idea brought forward by many. And also there's an interesting book by, by Brookman, I believe, from 2015, uh, where he essentially asked many very well-known scientists representing their domains, which ideas must die? And he didn't really mean you know, that they have to die. They just have to make room for new ideas. So which ideas are so powerful, so dominant, that they started to hinder scientific progress and therefore they have to be retired, not to use the term dying these days? Anything Good idea. comes to, comes to, to mind? In, well, in one, th one thing, uh, I don't know that it's such a powerful idea, but the GI science idea that the thing to do with cognitive behavioral GI science is to make technology act like humans and think like humans and so on, that's often totally backwards. You know, Reg College used to say, why do I want my GIS to make the same errors I make in spatial judgment? I use the technology to overcome my ways. of it. So that's one thing. I think a second thing, and I'm speaking to some of the psychologists, uh, no, I don't happen to think that research on non-human animal psychology is superior to research on humans. I'm not a fan of taking the research done with rats and so on and, and assuming that that somehow is better, more important, is central. Humans and animals are similar in a lot of ways. Humans are animals, but the humans are different in a lot of ways. And there's a whole tradition of research with human beings that gets ignored by a lot of those people uh, that are doing research on rats and so on. I think uh, a third concept, and this could come up again, um, could we slow down with the neuroscience fetishism? Please. I mean, you know, 
The people in neuroscience and architecture, it just, I have to laugh. You're not interested in the brain, you're interested in the mind. Oh, but if you say the brain, then you're a real scientist. Is that it? I'm no, I'm not a fan of that. That to me is just some kind of a fetishism. I'm not denying the great science done in neuroscience or its importance, its informative nature, and so on. But the way that the mind, which is what many people are really interested in, gets replaced with the brain, no, I don't, I think that's bad. Oh, very same now for a lot of the work about artificial neural networks, right? I think it, everything you said would also apply there. But I like what you said about the humans and the rats. It brings me to another question that I think is very important. Ethics. Obviously, in your kind of work, ethics plays a very substantial role, right? So what are your thoughts about ethics with regards to your role, but also with regards to your domain more broadly? Well, well I mean, I think everybody as a human, let alone a researcher, uh, should be ethical. Yes, of course. Um, but professionally, I would say, besides all of the common things you know about, about treating people properly, not stealing credit, all the other kinds of things that we all should be schooled in, um, I think the issue of the proper ethical attitude towards research on technology, you know, a lot of our research, especially when we're trying to get money for it, is geared towards improving the way something works. It could be technology in a more specific sense, like a GIS, or it could be technologies of how we administer human activity, different things like that. And basically, I'm really torn by that because um, a lot of it, I'm afraid, is um, it's dehumanizing. Uh, obviously, automation is something that I have been afraid of. I happen to think online education is automating the professoriate, and I'm not a fan of that. And I realize that I'm kind of a Luddite, and if you don't know what that word means, you should go look it up afterwards. But I would just point out that just because you're a Luddite does not mean that technology is not out to get you. <laughs> okay, let, let me be more clear about this. It's not so much technology. It's usually greedy people that are attempting to use technology to further their greed. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Amazon and similar things are as big an existential threat as climate change. And I am not kidding. I absolutely believe that. I'm probably full of it, but that's what I think. And that's not possible without technological advances that allow that uh, concentration of wealth and so on. You know, the dilemma for me is the following. <clears throat> Have you ever read Player Piano, a novel by Kurt Vonnegut? It's wonderful because it, it, it talks about a dystopian future of automation run amok. And it was written 60 years ago or whatever. And, uh, but at the end of the book, after the apocalypse has occurred, and there's like hope for a rebirth, uh, technology saves a day and allows them to get soda out of a machine or something like that. You see, there's something beautiful about the human nature that allows us to create and understand and devise and improve and so on. And I don't, I'm kind of stuck there. I mean, I would never, it, it would be silly for me to say, we should get rid of all technology. That would be silly. That would be disingenuous. That would be self-defeating. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a dilemma there for me. But I do like to push for the idea that You know, think about the implications of your work and whether in the end it is actually good for humanity or not, even if it's good for your scientific career or whatnot. I think that that's very important. And let me, let me add two perspectives here. I really like what you said in, in the last part and without going too much into philosophy here. What really strikes me is the meaning in the making, so to speak. No matter where you look, how far back in history, if you even look into the worst situations of, you know, of war and hunger and suppression, people always need to create, right? This is such a human Human thing. nature. Oh, it's and it's a beautiful thing. thing. Oh, absolutely. We need to, we are creative animals. Yeah. We, we derive so much meaning out of making something. It always yeah. astonishes me. You can go to the worst places on earth, right? And there will be still people who make things who like to be creative, who take a sense of beauty into account. Right? Oh, yeah. But I, but I was also interested in what you said about personal responsibility. <clears throat> so obviously right now we are seeing 
mapping and GPS and other technologies played out on both sides of you know of an of a, of a, of a conflict. But also, I think sometimes we don't realize that our abstract work that we are doing has very big ethical implications. My research is in data integration. Sounds harmless because it's such a generic term. But data integration could also be used as a key weapon to, to getting rid of privacy, right? What about your work about, for instance, navigation or understanding human mobility or human conceptualizations? Where's, where is the ethical risk in your own work and how do you mitigate it? Well, there's work that I know about, but I don't necessarily do it. <laughs> I might be trying to avoid it or whatnot. I mean, I mean, it's pretty obvious when you're tracking people, but if you have their permission, then I don't have any issue with that at all. I'm a fan of that. Um, along the lines of my Luddite nature, uh, I think any of you who know me, I don't even own a cell phone, <laughs> for instance. Never have. Um... I used to say, no self-respecting geographer would use a navigation system. But of course, the self-respecting geographers in the room really didn't care for that comment. Uh, but I do, uh, I'm definitely interested in the research that shows that the use of digital navigation systems um, harms people's ability to be oriented, to learn space, to form mental representations of space. And so I think that there are ethical concerns there. Um, and so I'm, I am involved with some colleagues in, in research on showing, demonstrating exactly how this is true or to the degree it's not true. There was a, was a question I wanted to ask very much towards the end so that I can leave the room quickly afterwards, but you're kind of provoking me to ask it before. So let's settle the record once and for all right now. What, how big is gender differences for, oh, for spatial cognition okay. and navigation? All right. I no, can, I can I'm, I'm not afraid. I don't know. I'm not afraid of the question. We're we're at a university here. It's supposed to be about what you sincerely believe. Supposed to. Be. <laughs> I'm going to give an answer that's both trite and provocative. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. Okay. First of all, get over it. Everybody knows that any kind of average group difference is not to be applied to individuals, right? We all know that, okay? But every time you talk about this, you got to make sure that you put that in there so nobody thinks that you're, you know, making automatic judgments about individuals. The second thing I would say, this isn't really trite, but it is to make everyone realize that the differences between females and males, the average differences, um, first of all, they're not as profound as many people assume. And they're not as... Mm, widely applicable or wide-reaching or as diverse as many people assume. On the other hand, I think the evidence is rather strong and many female academics who work in my area, researchers would agree with me about this, uh, that there are, there are some differences, average differences, which appear to be real. Um, are they large? Well, what do you mean about large? I mean, the biggest thing to keep about that, you say they're, they're between females and males, if we take, for instance, the ability or the tendency to think about space in terms of something like a two-dimensional layout, it's called survey reasoning or survey knowledge, that is something that repeatedly males uh, are shown to do better at or be more likely to think in that manner. Um, they're mostly overlapping distributions, of course, but still, mostly overlapping distributions can still, on average, have a rather big effect on what kinds of things people are good at, what kinds of things people like to do, especially if you look at the tails and so on. So um, I don't think that the, 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 there are some differences that are real, but men and women do not differ in all types of spatial thinking. They certainly do not. And there's even pretty strong evidence that women are better at some form of spatial thinking, such as static object location memory. Um, but Anybody who thinks either that they don't exist or that they're trivial or that they're easily erased, I don't think there's any evidence that says that that's the case. But let's keep the research going. <laughs> people love this research question, not only because people are fascinated by gender as well as sex, but um, it's one of the easiest variables. I know. Used I, to be. In fact, well, I was just going to say, 
In fact, I know it's not always that easy, but uh, why is there so many goddamn studies that compare females and males? Because it's just easy to go one and two, one and zero, which one is one and which is two? Oh my God. Okay, irrelevant. But let's, you know, I would just like to add this little provocative comment. Um, it doesn't bother me if it turns out, and I tend to think it's true, that on average, females and males have somewhat different preferences, interests, and so on. Why does that get everybody upset? Okay? To me, look, obviously I, I'm a good um, egalitarian thinker and so on, and it's absolutely wrong for opportunities not to be equal, and I realize it can be kind of complicated what makes equal opportunities, but it's my idea is not like we've only reached true social justice when every career and every profession and every interest is 50-50 male-female. That is absolutely not the case. And I'm sorry, if you think that it needs to be that way, I think you're an authoritarian. You're trying to tell people what they should be interested in, what they should be into, and I don't agree with that. Yeah, and there's a lot of gray in between, and that we are learning about this gray recently is, is very important. Which gray are you referring to? That is not exactly binary, right? But I, I don't No, of course thinking. not. But, uh, But I mean, even if, even to the extent that you treat the variable as binary, which I know is not exactly accurate, but there's, I talked about the distribution. Oh, I know. There's a, yeah. Absolutely. So we, we talked about your personal path, about some of your research interests, about ethics and so on. I wanted to talk about some very big picture ideas as well. Some domains like um, ast um, astrophysics, for instance, they have this big moonshots, to a certain degree also computer mm -hmm. science, where they try to rally across, or, you know, they try to rally around some well-defined by the community defined goals for like, you know, the next five or ten years, and then try to all make a contribution to this. And it's also a way of getting, you know, funding for a very important topic, yeah. but it's also great to benchmark. Where are you really going? Because, you know, we always believe a problem is solved, and then ten years later we are still doing it, right? So, first of all, do you like this idea of moonshots? And if you like it, can you think about <laughs> cognitive science or GI science moonshots? Right, okay, point? well, yeah, this... Um. My first response to this question is, uh, I'm, it's just not my nature to want to master the universe. And I, I don't know. I, I, this is going to sound a little bit weird, but I'm not that hungry to try to solve every mystery and get rid of every problem. That's, I don't know, that's kind of a weird thing to say, but it's what I feel. However, I will play along, and I will say my spatial cognition moonshot is to design a navigation, navigation system that helps people easily find their way, but keeps them oriented and allows them to learn the layout of the surrounding. But it's not going to be a five to ten year program. It's going to be much longer because it's a contradiction in terms. That's my interest. My well, this answer is so to interesting. You. First of all, I think this is a great moonshot, and it would be something that you know many people. Well, people are trying to work on it. Yeah, I think they won't succeed, but well, I don't think it's such a contradiction, right? You would just have to have multiple granularities. There was work from Microsoft a couple of years ago with I think they called this lenses, where if you are in a familiar environment, the navigation system gives you only very few instructions, and if you are in an unfamiliar, unfamiliar environment, the navigation system would give you more instructions. It's not exactly what you're saying, but it's getting there, right? They say no, it isn't. No, I agree with that. I'm familiar with that idea, and of course it's a good idea. Just like when you have a nav system and it tells you, not that I've ever seen this, except riding in someone else's car, you get off on a road and it tells you, uh, the exit, the, the end of the exit ramp is in 0.2 miles. I'm like, are you kidding me? You think somebody needs to know? Okay, that's all well and good. Those are better systems. I agree. That's just less ruinous to people's spatial cognition, but it's still, it's still hurting it, you know? The reason why I think it's a contradiction in terms is very simple. Why do you use navigation systems? So you can find your way more easily. More easily means with less cognitive effort, less attention, focus. Well, by definition, that's going to get in the way of learning, in my opinion. So that's why I think that the effort is a contradiction in terms, and good luck, and it's a good way to get grant money and so on, And but I don't think it's going to work. You know, if you want people to be more connected to the world, more aware, to learn more and stuff, you got to make their minds work more, not less. So, well, we're going to make a technology 
that is only used because it allows you to use your mind less. Uh oh. I, th I think we are finally getting into some controversial territory. So finally, I hope you okay. enjoy this as much as I do. All right. So let me poke you a little bit more. Also, you said something about data scientists in between. So I'm an information <laughs> scientist or a data scientist or a computer scientist, whatever you'd like to call me. And then there are people who call us out and ask questions like, is computer science a science? Is math a science? No. Is information science a science? Okay. And right, you know, recently, I, you know, having heard this for so many years, I, I come up with an interesting answer that I think is the more I say this and the more I repeat this to myself, maybe to convince myself, more and more shocking. If I would have to pick frontiers of science, like, you know, what happened very close at time to the Big Bang and stuff like this, other frontiers of science would be the brain and the mind, right? Right. And then I would have to ask myself, who did the boldest statements right now and can underlie them with results in the realm of what is the mind, what is intelligence? And that would be us, us information and computer scientists and data scientists, because I think we are about to discover something that is absolutely groundbreaking and maybe one of the biggest discoveries in the entire history of science Intelligence doesn't need consciousness. And let this sink in for a moment. We have, I think, pretty strong evidence for this now. But it gets even more. It looks like artificial intelligence is able to do creative works. And why people typically agree with the two statements, a consequence of the statement is that creativity doesn't need consciousness. And that then rolls people's minds. So I think us information scientists... We are actually the real scientists making the real discoveries. The real scientists. I like your, I like your confidence. I'm a chutzpah, yeah. <clears throat> well, I will start out by saying that um, I have a pretty clear opinion about whether computer science, geographic information science, inf is science or not. And some of it is, and some of it isn't. <laughs> you know, when you're trying to answer questions about how the world of information works, um, then you're being a scientist. But if you're doing accounting or, you know, marketing or, oh, gee whiz, dog and pony show type stuff, which a lot of it, I think, is, then I would say it is in science. Um, by the way, that everything shouldn't be science. Science isn't the royal road to wonderfulness or anything like that. There are plenty of super valuable things that are not science. Don't get me wrong about that. Um, I don't really um, accept your comment about the, how wonderful it is to show that we have intelligence without consciousness. I'm not saying wonderful. I'm just saying we how are How stupendous this. it is. Yeah. How, what an achievement. Because we've known that for a long, as long oh, as we've exactly. known anything. Look, when I walked into this room today, I walked through that doorway right there, and I didn't bump into the sides or anything like that. And I sat down, and I have no conscious idea how I did that. Yeah, that's because... That was intelligent behavior. Excuse me, sir. If I may finish. No, you're talking. <laughs> okay, yes. And you know what? And if I were to tell you now how I did that, it's only because I have some education in how the perceptual motor systems work that I can even give you a reasonable answer. We, we demonstrate all sorts of intelligent behavior without conscious awareness. You know, I did not come through that door in a coordinated manner. Part of my body and its nervous system did, but I wouldn't say I did it. So, I mean, I personally don't think that we have just recently shown intelligence without consciousness. I think we've known that for a long time. Yeah, but I do think that, however, not to totally dismiss your interesting observation, um, that um, some aspects of creativity and so on without consciousness, you could say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't tell us how humans are creative, not necessarily. Um, I mean, now we're getting into profound philosophical implications I so, yeah. that I, I don't have anything more to say about, other than I'm basically a terrified person of stuff like that, but whatever. Then you should watch some of the GPT-3 videos. I'm going to share them with you later. The fact that you went through the door, by the way, it's not really about intelligence. Yeah. It's just about the brain being a simulator, right? So, well, but I, that, that's the point. What is intelligence, after all? It's adapting to the world responding to the situation outside the body in an adaptive manner? I don't know what else you think intelligence is. I think I, I have some interesting thoughts about that, but I think we only have two or three okay. minutes. So I have, I have, we can discuss this on the patio, but I have two more questions that I wanted to really still ask. And I think they, they nicely fit into what we just said. 
So what is then your your deepest scientific insight about uh, cocci or the brain and mind? Yeah. This is a surprisingly easy question for me to answer. Oh, wow. And only it's just my opinion. <laughs> I'm not saying it's true, but I think it's true. But I've thought it for a long time. That's why I said it's relatively easy for me. You know, uh, the mind is not just the brain. Okay? The mind is an emergent phenomenon uh, and function of the brain and the nervous system in a physical body, in a physical and socio-cultural world. That's what the mind is. So that would be my leading insight about that. Last question. I have more here, but I think we also need to ask the audience for their questions. If you could start all over again, what would you study? Who would you become? <laughs> what a weird question. <laughs> Who would I become? Uh, somebody a little thinner? I don't know what he means. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, probably, and this is, now you're going to understand why I'm not thinner, but uh, I would probably be the chef owner of a fabulous restaurant, or perhaps the proprietor of a store that sold fine alcoholic beverages, or maybe the lead singer of a rock band, hopefully a good rock band, or maybe just somebody who wasn't as lazy as I am. I, I would be a captain of a ferry that always goes the same route back and forth every day so that I don't have to think why the ferry is <laughs> going back and forth. And in the evenings, I would stop by your restaurant then. Does this sound good? Okay, thank you so much then. Do you have questions to then, either provocative or less provocative? <laughs> Anything comes to mind that you would ask to? Uh, I just wanted to know how you would be the... Uh, <laughs> the way they did the previous several millennia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, if you're traveling like across uh, a couple of states or something, like, how are you? Mm -hmm. I have an atlas. I do look at maps, which is a form of technology. You know, I think the main thing I would object to, and again, this is a subject of ongoing research for us and others in the research communities. You know, um, the navigation system does this kind of thinking for you. It's not the spatial information. I look at maps on computer screens, but I figure out where the route is and I design the route and so on. Again, I'm not prepared to say we know 100% completely what are the key things that influence what you learn and so on, but I do think that one is likely to be pretty important. So that would be, a, that's, that's what I do when I take road trips or what have you, is I look at maps ahead of time and I take an atlas with me and stuff like that. And yes, if you really want to know, I have at times gotten lost in ways that you probably wouldn't. I almost missed a flight getting back to Logan Airport one time <clears throat> because I didn't have a little digital assistant to tap me on the shoulder and say, you turn left now, you know. Um, I was looking the other way when I didn't see the sign, whatever. I can handle that. And to ameliorate the maybe the loss of spatial reasoning in terms of some of the tools that yeah. ago, what are some of the educational imperatives or suggestions? You know, if I want my students to reason better. Oh, so, so you're not asking me a question about all, uh, what he yeah. said about how to design the technology? Because there are people working on ways to make nav systems that, that uh, support learning a little bit better. Um, you know, I would say just a lot of the classic things that the geography education literature has in it about learning places and making representations of places and uh, answering spatial questions like labyrinths and different things like that, a lot of that. I mean, just place memorization is just pretty low level, but still... It is, it is sort of a basic um, material for understanding the world, learning places, then learning where they are, then learning what their properties are. Again, pretty much I would say a lot of it is standard geography education for a century plus. Um, you know what? I think that that's a super good idea if your intent is not to make a system that people want to use because it makes their life easier. 
but it's a system that they use because they want to get smarter, just like we want our kids to get smarter. You know, we don't give them educational material that does away with the need for them to think. No, we give them educational material, hopefully that's engaging, and that um, prompts them to think and requires them to think. That, that's what I would say. Uh, Dan, as you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea that GPS can compromise people and navigational ability, but I wonder if it, it could be a, 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 a bit of a more com complex story where it seems plausible to me that people with, with particularly good navigational skills to begin with, that they might actually uh, find navigational instruments to be helpful in, in helping them to discover routes that they had known, to constantly be sort of orienting them to uh, the, uh, the de details of perhaps an unfamiliar locale. So do you think it's possible that they, they could simultaneously be harmful to some people and, and, and helpful to others? I mean, that's a great question, Jonathan, of course, and we don't know. Um, I think it is pretty critical, as a couple of things have implied here, that it's the specific way the system is designed. I mean, you talked about helping you to find new routes. Actually, nav systems have a way of not doing that. But if you design the navigation system to intentionally look for creative routes, maybe to use different factors to choose routes and so on, um, it's almost like I could see designing a nav system that was in, intentionally to help people with good navigational skills to even branch out further and learn stuff like that. So whether the existing systems would actually do that. But in general, I think it's a good idea what you're saying. It's, we don't know if that's true. We also have a question online, right? Yes. Yeah. A question from Corina online. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Corina. I'm yeah. curious about your view on the possible link between spatial boundaries and social boundaries. <laughs> it's a long story, everybody. Um, hmm, trying to think that's kind of a broad question. Well, on the one hand, you know, when you set up a spatial boundary, it tends to alter people's attitudes about the people on either side of the boundary. That's going from the spatial to the social. We can go from the social to the spatial, that the attitudes we have about people and where they live help us to set up mental barriers or boundaries between places that are spatial. Um, I think I would just say that. Well, she has a follow-up, but Mary? So Dan, I see you were trained as a psychologist, but you spend your career in the geography department. I'm just wondering, you know, if you could reflect on maybe <laughs> what, would, what, would your, what would your career have be been like if you were a governor down right. in Well, here's the first positive thing I would, I mean, look, you can't, I don't want to make, make it sound like, in some ways I'm really more into the forest than the trees, which is why I could make a change like that. And some of my deficiencies as an experimental psychologist that lead me to excel at what I have done rather than what I could have done. Um, there's a lot more employment opportunities in geography than there are in psychology. I mean, way more. It's just, and not, I'm not taking myself as evidence of that. I just know that uh, because of data. Um, you know, look, when I was a, a youngster growing up on a farm in Wisconsin, and I remember walking along on a beautiful sunny day and bees were around and there were plants and there was wind and there were odor from flowers and different visual things. and you know, and I really kind of got into it. It was like phenomenology, you know what I mean? And I know that that personally led me to want to look inward and got fascinated by psychology. I've, I've always found that fascinating. It is related to consciousness, phenomenology, and so on. But when I finally became a geographer, then I sort of realized, yeah, you know what? That stuff out there is just as much a part of the experience I'm having as what's in here, and I can attack it by going outward instead of by going inward. So I'm sort of, in that sense, um, it's, it's still been compatible with my basic personality and wanting to do that. Um, other than that, I could say a few things about, say, uh, conferences in geography versus in psychology. Uh, you know, the, the, on average, there's more rigorous thinking at psychology meetings, you know. Um, the parties are definitely more fun in geography. 
<laughs> I like where this is going. So before we take another question, let me ask a follow-up. So what would be then your best advice in 2022 for, for undergraduate and graduate students? Okay, communication is a key to all relationships, human relationships, right? Communication is really important. And uh, I would say keep it up. I would say make sure it's not strictly digital and you do get some in-person contact and, you know, keep those lines of communication flowing. Students, staff, faculty, students, don't be afraid to go talk to professors, you know. Most of us are only human. Uh, and I would also say that I'm a big fan of getting plenty of sleep. That's overrated, then. There's coffee. <laughs> it's coffee and sugar for that. Yes, one more. I have really two big questions, follow up or follow up on one. Like, do you notice any difference between the students that are more female in general, uh, or current class students versus No, well, that's a great question. Carol, it's obviously confounded with a variety of things. I won't you know, go into the boring details. But to be honest, I think that times are tougher now, you know, just in general. Um, I feel, you know, I was a graduate student from 82 to 88. Um, there was less pressure. I mean, being in a psychology program meant that there was tons of teaching. You know, there was lots of TA. And in fact, two years into my graduate school, I was instructing intro psych and other courses myself. So it means I wasn't necessarily like worried about getting funding and stuff. You know, that might be a little bit tighter nowadays. I think there's more pressure now to sort of be on a schedule and finish on time. And I, I don't mean to offend any of the faculty in the room who are trying to impart this lesson on their students and so on. You don't, I don't think you're given as much freedom to try different things out and to just kick back and do things that aren't necessarily going to lead straight to you finishing. And uh, you know what I mean? So I think that's a little bit tougher now. Um, on the other hand, you know, people were kind of more on their own back then. And I think we've come to realize increasingly that we need to give proper support. So I think grad students are supported like intellectually and emotionally, particularly emotionally and socially better than they used to be. Um, yeah, I, I have a provocative thought about this myself, and this leads me back to this paper-sized view of the world. If I would put it very provocatively, I would say that 50% of graduate students wouldn't get a PhD anymore if they would have to do a full-blown thesis instead of the three-chapter thing. And it's not only that we are now doing the three-chapter things. I already see colleagues who do even three chapters that are entirely independent. You just need three journal papers, right? I think there's value in this, in a big project and the value of letting your students get lost, right? That they need to explore, they need to develop their own curiosity, they need to have passion and be able to burn for a topic, right? Well, I don't think you should go to graduate school unless you have a certain amount of passion. Graduate school is not something everybody needs to do in this world. And, you know, I mean, what could be harder than trying to finish a PhD if you weren't into it? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the main ingredient to success in graduate school is being able to stick with it, and that is mostly supported not just by your fabulous discipline and will, but by your natural inclination to think about certain things, to do certain things. You know, I can't think of anything that's more important than that. I'd like to make another comment about this, though, that's, that's related to this, is that um, I think it's become quite common, I know it is true in the, our psych department, it's true in our geography department, that students don't do a master's degree and they go straight to the PhD. I'm not speaking out about the value of a master's degree. I'm not saying it has no value, but I'm saying what I like about it is when you do a master's thesis, you get experience doing research. This is more true for geographers than psychologists because psychologists have such a deep tradition of your first quarter in grad school, you're working on data. That's not true in geography. We have students in geography that start their PhD and they've never actually done a research project before. And that's, that's not good. So I'm, I'm not a fan of that. But I'm being told then that I'm standing between all of you and a good Mediterranean snack and that we are out of time. Anybody else on the... Uh... Yeah, I do have a question. It's more about our TTS music. So it's like, because our TTS help us like, by kind of reducing our cognitive effort and cognitive resources. Yes. 
So I'm thinking like, what if we kind of re reduce this kind of effort to navigate and reduce those like the to write poetry? To yeah. Things, to, to do other things. Yeah, while we're walking around, we could write a grant in our heads, huh? Yeah, I think you yeah, you could do that. I guess I like, could, like, when you're driving, like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, you do kind of guide us, like, where to go. And you don't have to pay attention to the world out there at all, right? <laughs> no, no, you have, there's no danger of missing your turn, right? When the digital assistant is going to warn you. Is that what you're advocating? No, I think she wants to do much, something more serious than enjoy That's scenery. <laughs> this is a great topic for discussion during the snacks. Thank you so much. Thanks for everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs>